Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson and welcome back to the Spider-Verse Retrospectives. Well, we're at time we venture further into tie-in country and for today's tie-in, rather than looking at a mini-series of the Spider-Verse title in it, this we're at, for today's tie-in, we're actually going to be looking at a an ongoing comic that tied into the Spider-Verse storyline. Specifically, we're at time, today we're going to be starting up the Spider-Woman tie-ins. Now, I have talked about Spider-Woman when I when I was doing my when I talked about the Spider-Verse storyline, but in this case, we're going to be looking at books that are going to be featuring her front and center as the main character and showcase what she was doing in Spider-Verse. But of course, since this is her central focus, I should probably talk about her backstory. Like, I, as, as, as was mentioned when I talk about Spider-Verse, the original Spider-Woman was a woman by the name of Jessica Drew. And basic, and while I did say that she was technically the female counterpart to Spider-Man, Rest assured that her get her shtick really has nothing to do with Peter Parker. I mean, her powers are similar to his. Like like Peter, she has proportionate strength, speed, and agility of a spider, and she can cling to and she can cling to walls like him. But rather than having web shooters like him, she instead has a venom blast that she can shoot out of her hands to stun people, as well as having a pheromone power which she can use to essentially turn guys into buddy in her hands it's not a power she uses a lot but it does come in handy with espionage and so forth but the thing is the but ultimate and all and the top of that while on top of that her backstory is very different from peter's now while the origin story can kind of tends to vary a bit basically her powers did not come from a radioactive spider bite rather depending on the story they kind of came from her parents. In one version of events, when she was a kid, she wound up getting uranium poisoning because from being out from overexposure, and her father wound up giving her a serum that was mixed with spider that was mixed with radioactive spider genetics, and she was placed in a, in this pot or whatever to incubate for several year for what was supposed to be a month, but wound up becoming several years. And when she arose, the serum wound up curing her, but also gave her spider powers. With an, with another version of the story, essentially with a, and a, with. Again, that's only one version, though. Another version actually has it so that that her that while her mother was pregnant with her, her mother wound up getting hit with a laser that contained the shortage and that can, assorted that contained assorted spider DNA that wound up mixing with Jessica's own genetic structure and again gave her spider powers. However, while both stories kind of differ in the beginning, they both do still have some commonalities. Basically, as basically as Jessica grew older, she her family she wound up living in Mount Wondagore, which as I've talked about before is supposed to be this mystical place in the Marvel universe. But unfortunately, she wound up falling into the hands of Hydra, who seeing their potential took her in, to wound up taking her in, brainwashing her, and trained her. Eventually, resulted which is what resulted in her creating the Spider Woman persona. However, eventually Jessica did learn about what Hydra did to her, regained her memories, and under the brainwashing and. From there, she wound up ditching Hydra and w and wound up joining the good guys with teams like with people like Shield, the Avengers, and so on, and essentially turned the Spider Woman persona into a more heroic one that's more fitting of the character. Based that, however, while Jessica is the one that spawned the Spider Woman identity, she's not the only one that's wielded it. There have been a plethora of other Spider Women across the Marvel universe, one of which who eventually would become Madame Web, who I, I think I briefly talked about during Spider Verse as well, but don't quote me on that. She actually, though, she will become important later in late in for later videos. Whatever, that's not important right now. Basically. There has been a, basically, yeah, the, the title of Spider-Woman has been passed around with one person even actually using it to be a straight-up supervillain. But as for right now, the current, but as for right now, for these comics, Jessica Drew is the current holder. And I think she still holds on to the title even to this day. So Jessica Drew is the central focus of this, which, again, if you've been following these vlogs, you should already know. But hey, good to have a history lesson, I guess. But of course, for tie-ins, how does she fit in? Well... If you remember back during Spider-Verse, yeah, there was a point in the story where multiple tie-ins essentially branched out to go and do their own thing. And one of those tie-ins, well, focused on Cindy Moon. As when, as when the Spider-Army went to go recruit Otto and his superior Spider-Army so they can be, so they can essentially merge the two groups together, well, the, the, the high number of Spider-People in one place, combined with the fact that two of the assorted Spideys 
were special totems, i.e. Cain and Cindy, who were the other and the bride, respectively, it wound up bringing the inheritors right to their door, with Otto directly blaming people like Cindy for this because their spider totem energy was just so high. Cindy wound up feeling guilty for this, and, not wa and knowing that essentially she had a target on her back since she was the bride, she wound up stealing a dimensional teleporter and decided to just go off on her own to ensure that the, to ensure that the spider army weren't getting caught in the crossfire as the inheritors came hunting for her. Of course, because of this, which is, of course, because of this, Spidey wound up sending Jessica Drew to go and keep an eye on her so she wouldn't be alone, and then likewise, Otto wound up sending Spider-Man to war after them because he wanted to keep an eye on Cindy. But, but, of course, after that, all the affair, every time we check back in with the group, which is briefly in the main story. We don't really know the full details about what happened, but that's where these, that's where the, today's tie-ins come in as... For the, as we start up the Spider Woman tie-ins, we're going to be taking a look at the beginning of the and taking a look and see what happened after the trio left the, after the trio split off from the Spider Army. As we take a look at Spider Woman Volume Five Number One, and the first image in the first and the first shot of the comic actually features Spider Woman, Silk, and Spider Man Noir, and a very different New York. Basically, this universe is basically Mad Max meets with. Basically, Mad Max meets Dune, which I that sounds a little weird because they both have similar themes. But I say that because it's essentially a post-apocalyptic Earth, but with weird futuristic society mixed in, like case in point, or com com complete with like weird aliens and um, and strange creatures. Case in point, the first thing we see is the trio riding on these weird lizard donkeys and basically the de and basically they're wandering through a desert but the sand is purple and even silk admits that, the, that where they're going is basically a golden version of new york city and i mean literally it's made of gold so ba and silk she's having the time of her life she thinks it's amazing which you know what i concur when you jump through parallel universes and see familiar environments change familiar environments altered and changed to fit whatever world you're in it's nice it's always one of my favorite things when you see other universes but while Silk is taking this all in and thinks this is all fun, Jessica's doing her best to try and suppress a migraine because, well, she's trying to stay business oriented. After all, she's here guarding Silk because she's the bride. She's a special spider totem, and the re and the whole reason they even jump to this earth is to get away from the inheritors. And likewise, while Silk is having the time of her life and wants to just sightsee and enjoy herself, Jessica's trying to keep her eye on the ball and. <coughs> But simply, she's getting on, just Silk's positivity is kind of getting on her nerves, which, 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 yeah, Jessica's own attitude kind of gets, kind of annoys Silk as well, because, well, she thought this would be like a fun little adventure. She finally gets to team up with the Spider Woman, see what she's like, and now she's kind of a stick in the mud, which, yeah, gets, gets on Jessica's nerves even further, and even she causes her to lash out and say, look, no, I'm a fun person, I'm a very fun person, when this is all over, you can come back and do, and shoot, and, and take, and take, <coughs> Excuse me a second. Sorry about that. A coughing fit was coming on. <clears throat> and there's a lingering effect. But anyway, yeah. Jessica tries defending herself, saying, Look, I'm a fun person, very even person. Once it's all over, we can come back here and take embarrassing bikini selfies with this world's sexy male electro. It's going to be fab. But for right now, we need to stay focused. And <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. We need to keep a low profile, which, yeah, doesn't... Which, yeah, this does not really resonate with Silk, who just thinks that Jessica's being a buzzkill. Although, at least Spider-Man Noir is on her side, he thinks the place looks breathtaking. Though Jessica still thinks that the... Though Jessica doesn't really think his opinion warrants anything, since he's from the 1930s. Even, even, she, even she admits her cell phone would, get, would impress him. But either way, they end up coming across a community of... I want to say... Se I don't want to say settlers, but basically they're people that live in the dunes and have like set up a little sh uh, their equivalent of a shanty town, having tents with shops, kitchens, and so forth. And Jessica pretty much what Jessica wants to do is she knows the inheritors are going to be eventually around for silk. So what they need to do is gather whatever materials they can and try to blend in. And when the and thus when the inheritors arrive, they can just sneak away without anybody noticing. So Jessica ends up leaving Silk and Spider Man Noir and tells them to just do, not do anything to get there to cause to cause a ruckus while she go while she'll go and get supplies which sounds easy on paper but there's one problem these are superheroes and i say that because as silk and spider-man noir are just kind of sitting around waiting for for jessica to come back they end up seeing some shitty things going on especially when they see these two guys on 
I guess, hover discs or whatever, who are hassling the, lo the, the, the local populace and stealing their food because shits and giggles. Which, yeah, does almost prompt them to go for, to go in to try to stop them, with even Spider-Man Noir getting ready to start kicking ass, but Silk has to remind them that, they need, that Jessica told them to lay low. Which, they almost do! Until the populace start fighting back and start throwing eggs at these t at these two at these two arrogant pricks, and it turns out that the hover discs aren't the only things they have on standby, as they all as they suddenly as they suddenly summon to them these weird golden armor suits that essentially are yeah overkill against against civilians, and as a result, when Silk sees that, she just says she says you know what screw this, there's only so much I can there's only so much I can watch before she jumps in and starts kicking ass with Spider-Man Noir joining her. So yeah, subtlety got thrown right out the window, which even Je which as Je which Jessica sadly ends up seeing as while she's getting food, she sees everybody looking at the resulting fa resulting dog fight, and Jessica realizes she needs to rush in and help, throwing a guy off of his own hover cycle and flying rent fly and flying into assist. And back but back with Silk and Noir, they thankfully have managed to take down the goons, but unfortunately their their little fight did get, end up getting the attention of some. Bad people, as a portal opens and Bricks and Bora of the Inheritors come out here to collect Silk. As such, Spider-Man Noir tries to give Silk cover as he opens fire on them, but his bullets do jack shit against the, against Bricks and Bora, who end up who end up just with Bora just casually jumping into the air and and landing straight on Spider-Man Noir's back, causing it to snap and very much and very much and very much critically injuring him. He isn't dead, but. Yeah, he's now wide open, and the and Bricks and Bar almost kill him, but Silk man thinks manages to shoot out a web line and pull him back, and ultimately, but ultimately they're still cornered. Thankfully, Jessica comes in to save her life as she as she flies in on the gold on her full on the hover scooter on the hover bike and manages to jump off it, causing it to and have it and fl having it fly right into Bricks and Bora. And as such, this does nothing again because they're inheritors. But Jessica does thankfully take advantage of the opportunity and cover that the cover that the explosion caused, and she opens a portal that allows her Noir and, and Spider-Man Noir and Silk to, to to leave this universe with the, with Bricks and Bora coming out and Bo and both of them getting ready to chase them and chase after them. In the meantime, back with the trio, they the wor we see that the world that they've gone to is the world of Marvel Noir, and the reason they're here. They gotta dump Spider-Man Noir. At this point, he's as we show, as I talked about in the main storyline, he's now critically injured and a liability. So for him, the war's over. He can't be. He can't. If he's stuck around, they would they would have to waste too many resources keeping it, keeping track of him. So Jessica thinks that maybe they need they decides to just dump him back in his home reality and let his loved ones take care of him, which they do as they stop by the Black Cat Speakeasy and leave Peter in the hands of Felicia Hardy. Silk thinks this is a dumb idea because this is the night because this world is set in the 1930s where they don't have any major super science or whatever. But Jessica pretty much tells her to shut the hell up. That they're in the middle of a war. That they can't just go get. That this isn't some magical fairy lackadaisy galavan. This is there. There. There's. It's them versus someone else who wants that. Who wants them all dead. And if they let up for a second, then the bad guys will win. And then the bad guys will win. And it's and they're all screwed. And Jessica's job is to keep Silk safe. And no matter no matter the cost. And sadly, that means that today Spider-Man to war was the cost. And if she and if just, and Silk pretty much has to suck it up and deal with it, whether she likes it or not. Which, yeah, this does start to make Silk feel bad, because, and Jessica does feel somewhat guilty for laying it down on her, because, again, part of the reason why she's looking down on her is because of Silk's lack of experience, and so Jessica tries to console her until she, Silk, and Felicia end up hearing a crash in the main room of the speakeasy. As such, while Jessica wants to cut and run, Silk thinks it's not a good idea to leave Spider-Man Noir here, as they believe that's the Inheritors, so Jessica decides to concede to that, and so she, Silk, and Felicia end up, go end up jumping, end up flying out from the bag, getting ready to fight whatever they whatever caused a commotion, only to find that it isn't the Inheritors. It's the main universe Spider-Man with Spider-Gwen and Anya Cortezone, which, yeah, this is when Peter went to go get her to get for her mission, which, as we later learn, was the stakeout on Loom World. As such, as such, once Jessica realizes that this is not the Inheritors, she ends up she ends up going with Peter, Anya, and Gwen outside, and well, she's not happy. She's not happy that she has to essentially play babysitter to Silk, and that Silk just seems like a kid with undiagnosed ADHD who seems to always follow the pretty shiny things, which. 
It's kind of insulting, and she doesn't use those words, but it's essentially the same meaning. And basically, while Spidey is still trying to keep the mood jocular because he's Spider-Man, Jessica is not going with it. She's just pissed. And she and when P and when Peter even tells her, "I'm taking you off duty, and I'm going to replace you with Anya and Gwen here," Jessica Jessica gets even more pissed because. Anya and Gwen are teenagers. She thinks that they won't actually do that if they try and protect Silk. They're just going to get themselves killed. They don't have the proper experience. But ultimately, Peter does advocate that they that he kind of needs her. That he that there's an important mission that needs doing. In this case, again, the stake out to Loom World. Though he doesn't ever say it. Though again, we know what it is because the spite of her storyline. And he thinks that she's the only one that can do it. And so Jessica does begrudgingly accept the the mission. Though, before she leaves, <clears throat> she does give Anya and Gwen kind of a... I'm going to call it a pep talk, but it's more of a word of warning. As pre as she tells them, they need to keep an eye on Silk for no, tw no matter what. They can't let her out of her sight, not even for five seconds, because if she does, because if they do, they're all screwed. That while Silk may be a good... maybe peppy, excitable, and she has a good heart that in any other circumstance would make them all love her, in the setting of the sp of this war, she's a liability, and that if they- and that if Anya and Gwen let her, she will get them killed. And, unfortunately for Jessica, Silk heard that, as she was listening in through the door, and upon hearing Jessica say that, she feels very guilty. As such, while Jessica ends up le- ends up leaving with Spidey to go and do her mission on Loom World. Anya and Gwen go back into the speakeasy to try and meet up with Silk, but all they find are Felicia Hardy and, and Spider-Man Noir. And when they ask where Silk was, Felicia says, I thought she was outside with you. At which point, Gwen and Anya realize that that that, that, that Cindy has flown the coop, which I, I, th which I guess me results in them calling Peter so he can come back and pick them up, because I know they join him back for the Spider-Verse storyline. Either way, that's another thing altogether. But me but basically, we the comic then kind of ends as we cut to Silk as she's ported over to as we have she end up just ditching everybody and ported by and can decide to continue jumping through alternate universes without any backup. In this case, landing in a universe where New York is completely covered in a giant snowstorm, and she is just burp and she pretty much makes it clear that she's that this is partly out of spite, partly because she, if she thinks that if she truly that if she really is a liability, then she's better off alone so that nobody else gets caught in the crossfire. Which, ultimately, she kind of feels she's proven right as she ends up getting attacked by this weird monster or whatever, but manages to swing away before she, before she can get hit, killed, thanks to her spider sense warning her. But sadly, the last thing we see in the comic is as she's swinging away, we see Bricks and Bora watching her from all the buildings, and, say, and, say, and talking about how it's a good thing they're going to be keeping her company, so. Okay, yeah, first issue. Storyline-wise, I think it's fine. It's actually pretty nice. It's again fine. It's really just he it not, it's this this first this the first issue kind of serves a dual purpose for the Spider Woman tie-ins. The first purpose is to essentially kind of we'll pick up where we left off from Spider Verse because as I meant because here's the thing despite this being Spider Woman number one, well. It's, again, a continuation of a storyline. Because this is a tie into Spider-Verse, it does need to essentially pick up from where Spider-Verse left off relative to the story. In this case, the last time we saw Jessica prior to the issue, she was going off with Silk and Spider-Man Awar to try and outrun the Inheritors. So, this is essentially meant to not just, just showcase what they, where they are and establish what they're doing after that. In this case, we see them as, we see them as they're trying to recuperate, with... Jessica essentially being, I guess, the mother of the trio, as she's the one thinking strategically. She's the one that's trying to get everything in motion and keep, and focus on keeping them alive. And so, as a result of that, she's not thinking about, oh, let's go sightseeing and all that. She's rather f instead focused on the best way to stay below the radar, which... That mindset makes sense because she is a seasoned superhero. She's been through her share of shit and she knows the best way to get through all this a lot in one piece is to be cautious when you can. And so as a result of that, when she actually is going through all this stuff and has to go through and as well, when she's going through all this weird stuff, she's not going, oh, wow, this is amazing. She's instead thinking, OK, we're in a weird alien environment. What can kill us and what is safe? So. I do find that interesting, which, kind of going back to the dual purpose thing, would also, 
as well, while it also serves to continue the storyline from Spider-Verse, it also has to establish what's going on here. Because, which, I guess kind of is, is kind of, kind of fits for both, for both halves of the story. For the first half of the story, it's just, just to establish what Jessica's general mission is at the moment, which is to keep Silk safe, but also to give her own, which, but also to kind of showcase her own mindset in relation to the war with the Inheritors, because, well, while Spider-Man is treating this like a typical jaunt, though he does take it seriously, obviously, but, well, Sin Jessica, Jessica's not Peter Parker. Jessica is not a jokester. She's not someone who goes around goes around making quips because it's funny or because she th or because it's fun to see the villain squirm. No, Jessica is a very different personality to Peter. While Peter likes to, while Peter just seems a lot more lighthearted despite the serious, despite his tra despite the tragedy that's been in his life. Jessica, as a character, ultimately does not. Jessica as a character is one who's kind of been through crap. Regardless of which origin story you went through, essentially she's been, she grew up with weird powers and abilities that she didn't fully understand in a strange, surreal place all her life, only to be kidnapped by psychotics who trained her to be a, we a weapon and all, and in when she eventually learned what she what they had done to her and what she and what and what what ha what she'd been through, she breaks free of them and essentially tries to go on her own way, siding with people who are actually heroes. And so, basically, living in that environment and having and going through that upbringing, of course, she's more serious minded. She isn't gonna be a Joker like Peter. She's Spider Woman. She is not Spider Man. Spider Man is the guy who quips. Spider Woman is the one who gets shit done. And uh, which I don't like saying that. I don't like saying it that way because it makes Spider Man sound incompetent. But again, she's a lot more uh, she's a lot more focused on the job against versus Peter. So it makes so again again I like the con again as someone who doesn't read a lot of Spider Woman comics, it's kind of interesting to see that contrast in their personality. So again, that so there that's that. But in the case of what makes the story interesting too is not only do we see more of how it how the whole war is affecting Jessica but how it's kind of affecting how everything else. As case in point, she's trying to keep everything in line, but then you got Silk. And it makes sense why Silk's demeanor would be so different from Jessica's here, because like Jessica said, she's a greenhorn. She spent most of her life living in a bunker and only recently got free. She's exploring not only a, a wide open world, but an entire multiverse. She just, and she, of course she's going to be looking at all this and thinking, wow, this is amazing. Despite the circumstances she's in, of course she would think like this. And uh, sadly, uh, the consequence of that is, yeah, she would not fully comprehend the danger. Yes, she's aware of the danger, and part of the reason why she's here is because she doesn't want people getting hurt because of her. But at the same time, she's never seen stuff like this before. Jessica's been through her fair share of superhero shenanigans. She knows how all this works. She's seen the odd and strange and surreal. So she's used to it. She's gone. She's flown with. She's kind of gone with the flow with it. So, of course, all this weird stuff for her is just Tuesday, pretty much. While for Cindy, it's all brand new and exciting and interesting. And she wants to see how. And she wants to continue exploring it, which, to be fair. I would be probably doing something similar. If you gave me the chance to bop over to another universe where some, where New York was a was a city made of literal gold with purple sand and future technology, despite everyone living in tents, I would want to see what that. I would want to see what this world has to offer. I would be. I would be acting like a tourist. I would be. I would be excited to see that, and Cindy reflects that well. So of course there's that clash in ID. So of course there's going to be that clash. But sadly, it's because of that clash that creates the bigger problem. Because ultimately, while Cindy is a lot more excitable than Jessica, well, Jessica ultimately looks down on her because of that. Just because Jessica is more experienced, compared when she has to deal with someone who is just so excited to be somewhere new and interesting, she sees her as a hindrance, especially in considering that the inheritors are on their tail and could pop up at any time, and she knows that in a fair fight, 
they might not be able to take them. We saw that in the store, and we've seen that in Spider-Verse. Whenever a Spidey encounters the Inheritors, it's a, it's a good chance it could be a slaughter fest. Even if you gang up on them, the Inheritors could still very easily turn the tide of battle if you're not careful. And again, it's just three of them now against a, against more against even more Inheritors, which, yeah, eventually turns into Bricks and Bora, and as we see, they're a very dynamic pair. They can work very well, much in sync, and when they do eventually show up, they almost and they almost win because when Sp well despite Spider-Man Noir offering cover for Silk, they just br they just fa they just mo they just critically wound him and almost kill him. So, yeah, it's clear that they are not that. I, you understand why Jessica is, is so afraid and is so stressed out like she is, and and compare that to Cindy. Yeah, Cindy in, in her mind, Cindy is a burden. I mean, she still wants Cindy to be safe because ultimately, because ultimately, the double-edged sword of that is that she knows Cindy's a pure and innocent soul who just wants to do good. And even she admits, yeah, any other time we would love her, we would love her enthusiasm because she has a good heart and wants to do good. But that excitement mixed with this environment and this in these situations, it's gonna get her killed. Which again, when you're kind of, in the case of Cindy, when she's faced with that reality, it does hit her. It does hit her hard. But ultimately, it's what pushes her away from Spider-Woman. As Spider-Woman, rather than just kind of... As, yeah, while Spider-Woman did almost talk her... Did, did almost say the right... Did almost get her back on her good side. Look, I'm sorry, I'm stressed, and I'm just mad at myself over this. She never got the chance of that. And the next time that Cindy ended up hearing Jessica talking about her... It was her talk. It was Jessica talking about how she basically can't be how she has to constantly be watched because if she because if she isn't, she will do something stupid and get us all killed. Which imagine hearing that. Even if you are inexperienced and have been making mistakes, to hear someone say this guy's a lost cause, just make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. Or just don't make sure he doesn't do anything stupid and ha keep an eye on him. How would you feel? That would feel like a slap in the face, really. Even if it was technically true. There's 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 telling the truth and then there's just being nice. And again, in a situation like the what's going on in Spider Verse, of course you're probably not going to be nice. Why would you be? They're in the middle of a freaking war against creatures that may or may not be able to be killed. Of course she, of course Jessica is going to be stressed. And in Jessica's defense, she didn't she didn't think that Cindy would actually hear her. And odds are, if she learned that what she said actually caused Cindy to run off on her own and almost get herself. And, got, and put herself directly in the line of the Inheritors, she might have pretty much been beating herself going, great, I did it when I shouldn't have said that in earshot. I think she would end up regretting it in that regard, but again, it's it, you can understand Cindy's point of view as well. Because, and like I said, because these two different per, these two different takes on what's going on in them are clashing in this way, it's resulting in t it's resulting in the con in a conflict that ultimately kind of pushes them further apart and creates even bigger issues. Now it's ultimately up to you which one you think is at fault. You could I think you could have both good valid reasons for both. I think it's basically just 50-50 with Cindy of course being inexperienced and inexperienced and like she said kind of jumping without think kind of jumping into danger without thinking, but likewise Jessica could be more tactful in how she deals with her. Which again, I understand both mindsets. Both mindsets do have their own valid reasons both both women do have their own valid reasons for why they're in these mindsets it just again it's just, when you when you have both of these two contrasting mindsets put together in the same room of course there's going to be conflict and as a result with this, when it comes down to Cindy and how she and how she plays her part in the story it results in her just going off on her own saying screw you guys i can handle myself and just go and ultimately kind of leaving her wide open for the inheritors as she j starts jumping from universe to universe. So again, that's another that's more set up for her and kind of furthering along her story, but in the case of Jessica, the first issue also kind of acts as a prologue for what Je or well, yeah, that's what it is for Cindy. Sorry, again, I get names mixed up very easily, which you will notice if you actually watch these vlogs. But yeah, that's how things go with Cindy with in her situation. But as for Jessica Drew and what's going on with her, issue 1 also sort of acts as a prologue. Because while this does kind of further along what goes on with Cindy and how she's jumping from universe to universe to avoid the inheritors, for Jessica, I meant I say it's a prologue because ultimately her real mission begins in issue two. And we see how it begins when Spidey goes to her and says, Look, I need you for something, so you gotta come with me. So you don't and you don't know what it is, but it's clear but ultimately it's something that's important, which again, okay, we already know what it is. We've we saw what it is in Spider-Verse, but by that same token, 
But when you're if you're just reading if you're just reading it like this and how just try, and basically let's imagine if you were reading Spider Verse fresh off the rack and instead of reading it the way I am you just go you just start trying to intersperse all the issues with the tie-ins. Of course you wouldn't understand until you started reading the books. So it ultimately just serves the purpose of excuse me a sec. Sorry I was checking on my old guy, the dog, my daughter dog Xander. Whatever. Anyway, either way, yeah. Either way, again, if you're reading this, like, if you're reading this, like, fresh off the rack, would not, if you don't know what, basically, for both sets of perspectives, you wouldn't understand what, what the mission is until, yeah, <clears throat> until you pick up the next issue of Spider-Woman, or in some, or in one case, pick up the next issue of Amazing Spider-Man. So, again, I do like, kind of, so, again, I do like, kind of like the prologue with that, but ultimately, the bigger conflict in the story is the stuff with Cindy, as she's ultimately the one the Inheritors are after. And so, Jessica, and so basically, how we see this from Jessica's perspective is how she's essentially interpreting the stress of the situation. She's not, she's not, think she's has to deal with a character who's excitable, energetic, and basically wants to, just, and wants to see everything, but likewise kind of has to, and just kind of has to, but ultimately is still trying to remain focused and, and keep an eye on the bigger picture. And again, contrast that with Cindy and you just got a recipe for a stressed out individual who is just one mistake away from exploding. So there you go. It's again, kind of interesting to see how she reacts. And I think it helps kind of feed into what happens to her at the end of the, of her tie-ins because put simply when you fight in a war with a bunch of other people, with a bunch of variants of a guy that already kind of annoys you, it, is going to result in some in a kind of a blow up but that's kind of neither here nor there there either way when it comes down to the issue though i think it's still fine it sets up what's good it sets up jessica and her situation well and how she's interpreting the events of spider-verse beyond just being another spidey from 616 who's a part of this whole thing so I like that. That's cool. I like the, I like the clash between her and Cindy and how Cindy kind of has to deal with it, has to deal with everything herself and how she kind of interprets Spider-Woman as she tries to keep her leveled, so to speak, while also trying to do, while also trying to outrun the inheritors, which again I like. I do kind of like seeing the I think the I, I like the action, so to speak. I guess I do like the creativity with the other worlds as but I, I will give credit where it's due because this because the worlds they're going to don't really have designated spider people. It allows them to kind of see more of how the worlds operate, which I dig. I always like seeing all the universes and how and their and their regular shticks. But and of course I do. And of course the fi of course the finale when Cindy goes off on her own and we see the inheritors going out or Bricks and Borer going after that going after her does leave enough suitable tension as well as leaving enough mystery with Jessica as Spidey gives her her mission to go to Loom World. So I dig it. It's nice. I feel like the only major re I feel like the biggest problem for me in the story though is the artwork. I don't talk about the artwork a lot for these comics which I really should as art is it's a comic book. Art is a big part of comics, but for the Spider-Woman tie-ins yeah, this is a thing I need to discuss. So who here knows who Greg Land is? For okay, so if you don't if you if you if, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, Greg Land is a comic book artist, a no, a well-known name in the industry. Infamy. Well, but, well, it's, he's known in infamy mostly. Why? Because he's a tracer. His gay main gimmick as an artist is that he traces his artwork from pinups or magazines or so, so forth, and... Put simply, he's not very creative with it. As a result, characters tend to look off-model or don't look exactly the same, or basically look strange in single panels, or their expressions can change, their features can change from issue to issue, from bot from panel to panel, from page to page, and it can look a little and it can look awkward. And sadly, the same is true for this issue. As said several points, basically Jessica and Co. will make weird poses or weird expressions that don't make sense, which I'll see if I can find an example here. Let's see if I can actually get a good one. Hold on. Yeah, I think if for I think one a good example for how crappy the artwork is is this is this panel right here with Anya and Spider Gwen. Just the way they're reacting when they realize that 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 Cindy is, is gone isn't an expression of, oh, crap, an expression of, oh, it's just weird. It's like, oh, what's going on now? Like, it's just 
awkward in many regards. And that's just a small snippet. And sadly, it's that way with the rest of the story. It just feels awkward and strange and... I won't deny it. It, it can act as kind of a hindrance. The story itself is fine. I won't I won't deny that. But the artwork is definitely a, is what is definitely something of a drawback. And as a result, just for the artwork alone, the Spider Woman tie-ins definitely kind of make me feel a little wary of the of the of the book. Again, not saying the story is bad. It is good stuff. And again, I like the character. Cl and I like the, I like the stuff with Jessica and Cindy and how they're both reacting to the uh, to the whole thing and where and how and what. How not only does it put them at odds, but it sets up where they're going to be going further in this in this in this storyline. But over but. Again, the artwork is definitely still a flaw, and sadly, that's going to be a continuing complaint as we can look through the remaining issues of this tie-in, so... There you go. Other again, otherwise, the story itself is fine, sets up things well, good act, has some has some cool action, creativity with the worlds they visit, I like seeing Jessica and Cindy clash, I like seeing the conflicts that evolve, how things develop for both characters and where they end up going because of this, Overall, nice beginning, nice beginning, and I look for, and it's ultimate, and, I look, and it's cool to see where they go from here, so. Yeah, I think that's about all I can say. I hope you enjoy the video, I thank you for watching, and I hope you tune in, I hope you tune in on Tuesday as we look at issue two of, Sp of the Spider-Woman tie-ins. So, till then, hope you have a good day. I'm Samuel Johnson, and I'll see you then. Take care.